start. Um, we had an amazing time yesterday at our men's round table. And we are just, I'm so, so encouraged by some of the guys. And it's just been awesome. So I want to encourage you guys. The next one will be September 23rd at the Yellow Rose Diner. It's, we do have our September calendars in the back. If you did not get one through text, and if you're not receiving any uh, texts from us and want to get on our texting list, um, it's on the back of the, the lyric sheet that you have. There's the uh, QR code. You can just click it, and we'll connect with you, and this way you can receive updated announcements and things like that. Moving forward, um, this week we've got the Thursday Bible study at uh, here in Keyport at Roberta and June's home. So. You guys are free 11 o'clock in the morning. It's awesome. It's awesome. They do a great job. So we're excited. Now, the big thing I want to share, first of all, there is no Kingdom Kids today, so the kids are going to stay here, as this is the last kind of big summer weekend. Uh, we know a lot of people are just doing their last weekend fling with today being so nice and all. But next week, things start rolling back up again. So one of the things that we have going on, uh, some of you already know this, but we're just kind of making it official and public and broadcasting it now. Keyboard approved us to do a, a, a worship festival on Saturday, September 16th at the mini park in Keyport by the stage in the gazebo area, but you'll see a stage there. It's going to be in that place. Now, we're so excited about this. But they didn't give us much time. We had applied several months ago, but it took them forever to say yes. So anyway, we've got three and a half weeks to plan this thing out. Pray for us as we do this because what the provision of this thing, this worship festival, it's going to be called Sound of Hope, is not any one church to do everything. It's to bring local church, either worship teams or uh, gospel choirs involved in this. Now, for this first first one, we're we're looking we're looking to get four or five different churches involved, and so and I need to finalize this by Wednesday. So keep that in prayer, please, because we need to start promoting and that kind of thing. But this is where the greater church can help beyond just prayer. On the day of the event, there's things leading up to the event and day of the event. The day of the event, we are going to have a prayer tent set up uh, where Anthony, who will be back here in the next couple weeks, uh, will, is organizing a prayer team who will be ministering in a tent. We're going to call it blessing tent, prayer tent, just something that someone who's not a Christian is going to be scared about. But we'll, we'll definitely promote it that way as a blessing tent and prayer so if you would like to be involved in the prayer ministry tomorrow you will be getting a text on our texting system with a link to sign up genius to sign up for the prayer ministry because anthony then will be in touch with y'all one way or another to organize it so we're going to need people who are going to want to serve in the prayer tent but then we're also going to need secret agents who will infiltrate the crowd and see who God highlights because that's what we believe, right? If I'm walking down the street and God highlights someone to me, there's a reason why God highlights that person to me. You know, he may want me to pray for them for something or encourage them somehow. And that's where an act of faith. If you are that kind and want to be bold, talk to Anthony about it as well. Hey, Luke. Can I get you to turn off the echo on uh, line one, please? Thank you. Just realize the echo's still on. It's channel one. Thank you. No, no, I'm the, I'm the soundboard. Where it says uh, effects. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so that's what we need. The other thing of the day of the event, the event is right now we're allowed to go from 12 to 6. We also are looking to have like face painters, different things. If you have something, if you're great at making balloons, let us know because we want to make this a family environment. 
and, and as much as possible and attraction. And we have somebody here in town who might try to get like a, one of the ice cream vendors to come up with an ice cream cart, things like that. So we're trying to make this special because our prayer is that the town will notice how effective and wonderful this is, that it can be a yearly event, that we can even plan it in January for next summer, you know, when they come out with their calendar. So please pray towards that. We're also gonna need people who will come at 11.45, 12, to help set up, because we'll have a lot of equipment to set up, tent to set up, things to organize, and just be available to do whatever it may or may not come up. So there's a lot that we're gonna to have to do for this, so if you are willing to volunteer and are able to for, even if it's just a couple of hours, if not for the whole time, let us know, because we're gonna need a, a full team. Anthony will be in charge of the prayer ministry, so see him about that, and he'll be in touch with those. Yes, tomorrow night. Tomorrow at five o'clock, you'll get a text with a link to sign up at Sign Up Jesus. So for that, so we're excited about what God's doing with this, and uh, we're praying that just Holy Spirit is is just overwhelming, and glory of God shows up, and people are blown away, and the town gets excited about what's happening. So we've had great favor with this, with the leadership, so thank you all who have prayed to this point, but now we just got to shift it to a different gear and a different mode. So please keep that in prayer and anything that you can do, if you know somebody who can make balloons, face paint, things like that, bring them out. So we're going to reach out to those things. Am I missing anything? All right, great, great. Awesome. So this morning we are in Genesis chapter 42. Genesis chapter 42. You have your Bibles, pads, tablets. This is the story of Joseph. Most of us are aware of what happened to Joseph. He was sold into slavery by his brothers who were very jealous of him. Jealous of the love that his father had for him. And uh, Lauren, I'm glad you brought her forgiveness because this is what it's all about today. Um, you sold into slavery, eventually, through circumstances, was thrown in jail. But God's anointing in hand will never left him. And a very much shortening, a longer story here. He eventually was able to interpret a few dreams for the Pharaoh, so Pharaoh made him second in command of Egypt. And, and one of the dreams he interprets was that there was going to be seven years of flourishing. Egypt was going to flourish with food and the harvest, but then there's going to be seven years of famine. So that happened. So we're talking a minimum of 15, 16 years between when Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers to the point we are today, okay? A minimum, could be more. Minimum of 15, 16 years, just from logic's sake. Tells us this. So now Joseph is the second in command of Egypt, and he was put in charge of distributing the food during this time of famine. So, what happens? Joseph's brothers show up because their father Jacob heard there's food in Egypt. So he sends his brothers, all but the youngest Benjamin, who is now, in a way, taking Joseph's place as the pride of joy and joy of his daddy. He left him at home. But the older brothers all came to Egypt. And when they saw Joseph, when they went before Joseph, they did not recognize him, but he recognized them. So what happens? 
series of events taking place, he kind of plays with their mind and their hearts a little bit. He asks them about their father. He asks them about their brother. He asks them what's been going on. He actually then acted as if they stole something because he had a servant put something in one of their bags. And now they're freaking out. They're freaking out. We're in big trouble by this top level government official in this foreign country. I mean, imagine something like this happening to us in Russia or China or something of that nature. So they're very much freaking out. So then Joseph said to them, I have one request. If you want to make things right, bring your little brother to me. And this is chapter 42, verse 20. But I want to now read the whole this whole section first so you get the greater picture. So, Judah said to Israel, his father, now the guys are home, and keep in mind that before they left, the money they paid Joseph, he had his servant put back in one of their satchels or bags. So he's just kind of playing games sort of with them, but there's a higher purpose to this that's taking place. And in the meantime, he told them that one of their brothers he's going to hold as collateral. So not everyone went back to his brothers or to his father's house. But now when they get to the father's house in Genesis 43, 8 to 34, Judah said to his father, send the lad with me and we will arise and go that we may live and not die. So here's the brothers saying, let us take your pride and joy, the thing that you hold most valuable to you, with us so we don't die. So we don't die. Both we and you and also our little ones, I myself will be surely for him. From my hand you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. This is Judah, the eldest son. And you've got to remember, Judah is already dealing with the guilt of agreeing with his other brothers with what happened to Joseph many years ago. So now he's in the same situation Will he redeem himself or not? Because God puts us in situations to redeem the mistakes of the past. For if we had not lingered, surely by now we would have returned the second time. So they're getting worried about their other brother because they've taken so much time deciding should they go back or not. And their father, Israel, said to them, if it must be so, then do this. Take some of the best fruits of the land in your vessels, carry down a present for the man, a little balm, a little honey, spices, myrrh, pistachio nuts, and almonds. Take double the money in your hand and take back in your hand the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. Perhaps it was an oversight. Take your brother also and arise and go back to the man. And may God Almighty give you mercy before the man that he may release your other brother and Benjamin. If I am bereaved, I am bereaved. So the men took that present and Benjamin, and they took double the money in their hand, and arose and went down to Egypt, and they stood before Joseph. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the steward of the house, take these men to my home, and slaughter an animal and make ready, for these men will dine at noon. Understand what just happened. These men showed up to Joseph 
with blood stains, spiritually speaking, on their hands. Their sin was all over. What did Joseph do? They came with offerings. They didn't know yet to offer their hearts, but they knew to bring offerings into the house of this king. Joseph said to his servant, take them to my house, the place where I dwell, and then slaughter some food for them. They're going to dine with me. What does that remind you of? What did the prodigal son He was expecting rejection with sin on his, in his life. And instead, the father embraced him well. Joseph, as a figurehead representing the heart of God, he was embracing them. Take them to my house to dine with me. Then the man did as Joseph ordered, and the man brought the men into Joseph's house. Now the men were afraid because they were brought into Joseph's house, and they said, it was because of the money, which was returned in our sacks the first time that we are brought in, so that he may make a case against us and seize us to take us as slaves with our donkeys. When they drew near, to the steward of Joseph's house. They, uh, they talked with him in the door of the house and said, oh sir, we indeed come down, came down the first time to buy food, but it happened when we came to the encampment, we opened our sacks and there, each man's money was in the mouth of his son. Our money in full weight. So we had brought it back in our hand. And we had brought down other money in our hands to buy food. We do not know who put our money in our sacks? But he said, listen, peace be with you. Relax. Take a breath. You don't have to do anything than what was asked of you. I forget the, the scripture, but you have shown me, O man, what the Lord requires of you. Yes. Um, thank you. What does the Lord require of thee? Micah, he has shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So he's saying, just relax. Because the servant, whether he had inside knowledge or not, knew that house was not a place of judgment, but a place of love. Okay? You go to the court, not the dinner table for judgment. Joseph was inviting them to his dinner table, not his court. But they could not see that because their hand, from a spiritual sense, had blood stains on them. And they were filled with so much guilt, so much shame, because they're going, this is deja vu. We messed up big with Joseph when he was young, and now this is how God is punishing us and judging us. And our father, we broke his heart once, now we're going to break his heart again. With Benjamin. So they're scared. And what happens when you get scared? All of a sudden, your mind goes in places it shouldn't go. Because you're not thinking, God's got this. I'm at peace. They could not see the fact that they were going to a dining table. <coughs> Not a jail cell, not a courtroom or courthouse. 
They were going to have lunch with a king. Peace be with you. Do not be afraid. I love this. Your God and the God of your father has given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. This is an Egyptian servant who knew the God of Joseph. He worked for Joseph. So tell me Joseph did not reveal God to the servant for the God servant to declare this, right? For all we know, he might have been converted to Judaism. But an Egyptian servant living in the house of Joseph who saw the power of God at work and saw the love of God at work because he was the one who put the money in the sacks of these people by the order of Joseph said, hey, your God and the God of your father has given you these things back. He's blessing you with these things. Then he brought Simeon out to them, the brother who was taken as collateral, so that the man brought the men into Joseph's house and gave them water, and they washed their feet, and he gave their donkeys feed. Would they be in trouble if that was happening? When we enter the presence of the Lord, we always get way more than we deserve. We also always get way more than what we expect. We come in saying, Lord, you know, I, I'm not hurting. Heal me. Well, he not only heals you, but he elevates you. He takes you a step further. God isn't the God of just enough. He's the God of everything. He's the God of the more. He doesn't give you just what you need so that you're going to be just satisfied momentarily, but he supplies all our needs. That's why he is Jehovah Jireh, God, my provider. So what needs do we have that we're struggling with? What, what, and those needs are not necessarily material or physical needs, but he's also dealing with the heart needs, the wounds of the heart, because those are the deepest needs. Then they made the present ready for Joseph's coming at noon. They still didn't get it. Let's get the money together. Let's get all the spices together. Hurry up so we can give it some. Remember, Egypt flourished for seven years. Egypt did not need their spices. Egypt did not need their money. Joseph did not need their money. But they were not there yet. Their heart had not been tuned in to God's heart yet. They had not been able to receive the restoration process that Jesus was doing through Joseph, that God was doing through Joseph. And I'm equating Jesus to this because I want us to see how Jesus works in our lives here. Because I want this to be very personal for every single one of us. Because I, I feel like what they're dealing with is something very real to each in our own way, but very real to us that we struggle with at times. They made the present ready for Joseph's coming at noon, for they heard that they would eat bread there. And when Joseph came home, they brought him a present which was in their hand in the house and bowed down before him to the earth. Then he asked them about their well-being and said, is your father well? The old man of whom he spoke, is he still alive? And they answered, Your servant, our father, is in good health, and he is still alive. And they bowed their heads and prostrated themselves. Then he lifted his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son. Remember, um, Benjamin, jo uh, Jacob had two wives, Leah and Rachel. Joseph and Benjamin were from Rachel. 
So they were the closest in many ways. Is the younger brother whom you spoke of, he said? And they answered, Your servant, our father, is a good episode of Elijah. Then he lifted his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, Is this your, your younger brother whom you spoke to me? And he said, God be gracious to you, my son. Now his heart yearned for his brother. He just wanted to, like, jump down and break him. So Joseph made haste and sought somewhere to weep and went into his chamber and wept there. He went in the bedroom and cried. Second in command of Egypt is weeping out of pure joy and love for his brother. The Bible tells us when a son or a daughter comes home to the father, the father's heart weeps. All heaven rejoices, but the father weeps in joy. He sings over us. All he wants is his son and daughter to be able to receive his embrace and embrace him. Then he washed his face and came out and he restrained himself and said, serve the bread. So they set him a place by himself and then by themselves and the Egyptians who ate with him by themselves because the Egyptians could not eat food with Hebrews, for that is an abomination to the Egyptians. So they, as a culture, Egyptians saw themselves to be like the greatest culture of that time. So they would not eat with people they looked at below them. Kind of what later happened with the Jewish community, they wouldn't eat with Gentiles to some, in some ways. So there was a plate for them, and then he ate with those who considered Egyptians because he was an honorary Egyptian. And they sat before him, and the firstborn according to his birthright, and the youngest according to his youth. And the men looked in astonishment at one another. They couldn't believe what was going on. Then he took servants to them from before him. Think about what he just did. They had their table with their food. But Joseph got up, took food from his table, not his servant, he did, and served it to them. Psalm 23, he prepares a table for us. He sets the table for us. Jesus is the bread of life. He gave his bread. Because that's what they were eating in those moments. Probably dipping it in honey or oil or something like that. He served them. And then, Benjamin's serving was five times as much as any of theirs. So they drank and were married with him. Look at all these blessings that just happened. They looked at each other in astonishment because they were blown away by what God was doing. They could not believe what was happening. They came expecting one thing or things to work out a certain way and the Lord totally flipped the script on them like he does to us. But why wouldn't they expect God to move? Why wouldn't they expect God to do something? See, Joseph just simply asked them, do this one thing in 420, in 4220. Bring your brother to me. He didn't say bring extra spices. He didn't say bring extra money. He didn't accuse them of stealing their money back. He just said, come to me with a thing that would be considered the most cherished in your life. And outside of their own lives, Benjamin was because they knew what he meant to his father. Because of the guilt, stains, and shame they were dealing with. So they took a long time to do this because they were fearful. And the reasons for disobedience, some of the reasons is his brothers were afraid of Joseph. 
Because Genesis 42.14 said, but Joseph said to him, it is as I spoke to you, saying, you are spies. So first, initially, he accused them of being spies. Again, playing with their mind. So now there is fear. When there is fear, our sight is blocked. So a lot of times when we want to go to Jesus, when we're trying to get things right, we're not ready to do the one thing he asks us to do. We feel like we have to do more because fear says that's not enough. I'm afraid. So I have to bring more than I think I, I should bring to overcompensate because I am afraid. It's like going to court and you have the evidence that you need for you, to prove your point, but then you bring a bunch of other stuff that in your mind looks like more evidence when it's useless, when your lawyer is saying, you don't need that. You don't need that. You don't need that. But, but they were so full of fear, they couldn't help themselves. Another reason they uh, were, is his brothers were afraid of losing something else. They were insecure or lack of confidence, and that comes through shame. So you've got fear and you've got shame going on right now. So they were insecure about it. In Genesis 42, 9 says, 42, 19, he says, if you were honest men, let one of your brothers be confined to your, to your prison house. But you go to uh, and, and carry grain for the famine of your house. Sin has led to shame that led to insecure feelings about their honesty and what kind of men they were. So they already lost Joseph. Now they've got Simeon who's being held for collateral. They're afraid of losing him. But the, but the shame now is keeping them, are, oh, am I gonna lose Benjamin as well now too? How many times am I gonna keep losing things of value? See, there's only one thing we need to let go of, and that's our pride. Shame keeps us from letting go of our pride. In this case, Benjamin represents that pride. One thing I ask is what Joseph had told him. Bring your brother, brother to me. Bring him to me. But we're going to bring everything else, and we're, gonna, we're afraid to even go back. Because shame is in a fear. In the fear of losing something else, they could actually, they lost their brother's sister for those moments. For the shame that takes place that keeps us from going to God. I, sometimes it feels like I can't. I can't go back there. And see, this shame has a hurt that comes with it, right? Because to admit my shame might cause me pain. Might cause another wound. At least that's the way my mind is thinking. Instead of realizing, if I just do the one thing Jesus is asking me to do, he will bring healing. When they did what Joseph asked them, was there shame? Did you hear any rebuke in any of this? Their rebuke came earlier on when they were playing games with him, when they were still covered in their sin. But now they're in the process of repenting, changing their mind, being restored. And being restored is a healing process. And to go through a healing process, you have to deal with the thing that caused the hurt that you need healing from. So now they have to face the truth. So there is shame, and which is the third thing, is the brothers were afraid of the truth that would be revealed. Maybe the sin that would need to be confronted. They're afraid of that judgment. They're afraid of the fact that their father might find out the truth about what they did to his favorite son at the time, Joseph, and what he might do to them. Sin has to be repented of. It has to be. Sometimes we, the church, make a bigger production out of that 
than it needs to be. I love what Chris Valentin says. Um, he tells a story of he had a young couple come to him. They weren't married, but messed up with each other. And he didn't bring it to the whole church. They dealt with it. They were willing to repent, so they were willing to work with them to bring healing and restoration. And the question was brought up, shouldn't they be brought to the church and the church? No, but it's like, you've got a, a, a little mark. Why throw a gallon of paint on the wall? A little mark. If the person is wanting to be healed and willing to be healed, then you love them through the healing process, the restoration process. You don't need to broadcast sin to the world. I know there are some churches and situations where somebody may need to come up and confess something to the church. And as a church leader, I've done it before. When I've made a mistake, I've repented to the church, said something I shouldn't have said or misled anyone in any way. But you don't post somebody's news to the world if they're willing to deal with it. If they're not, maybe a natural series of events might take place where then the church will need to be made aware of what's going on. But if you're willing to repent of your sin, it doesn't have to be a production. Go do the one thing Jesus asks you. Bring this thing that represents what it is that's holding you back, that represents your shame, your struggle, your sin, the thing that is defining who you are right now and has had a grip on your life and bring it to Jesus. There was no shame, no guilt, no judgment here. Instead, when they did what they were asked to do, there was a table prepared for them in Joseph's house. The Father's house welcomed them in, welcomes us in. The Father prepares a table for us in his home. All we have to do is the one thing that he asks us to do. Another reason is the cost. Is the cost too high? Is what's required of me too much? Well, they came back basically with three times the money. Because the father doubled up the money and told him to take the money that was put back in your bag, then bring spices. That's a pretty high cost. And then the highest cost is, a, is another precious son. But that cost wasn't taken from them. They did not pay for their salvation or their healing or their restoration. They were just obedient in doing it. Remember when God spoke to Isaac and said, Isaac, your son, I'm sorry, Abraham, your son is the most precious thing to you. I want you to go sacrifice him to me. Remember how the greatest cost, imagine waiting 100 years to have a son. Now you're about 113 years old because, you know, he's a bit close to that age. And then God said, I know you love him and adore him. <laughs> But now I want you to go sacrifice it to me. He could have said, that's too high of a cost. I can't. I just can't. But that was the one thing that was asked of him. He stepped out in faith to do the most painful thing he could have humanly ever done. And the thing that would have haunted him the rest of his life, at least in his mind, the way he's thinking. Instead, because he did, 
who has told your descendants are going to be as great as the stars in the sky and the sands of the earth. No judgment. He did what was asked, and blessing was released. He didn't, he didn't just say, oh, now I know you truly love me. I love you even more than your son. Okay, go back home. You're done. He didn't give him just enough. He released blessing into his life. He released prophetic destiny into his life. So when God says, do this one thing, and just, you can read this for yourself, but the rest of the story is, Joseph didn't know who he was to them. And he told them, what you guys meant for evil, the Lord had a greater plan for you. And my plan, not only did God restore me, but he restored me to restore you. Go get your dad. And we know for many, many years, Israel flourished in the land of Egypt because of Joseph. So what is God asking right now? What is this one thing we need to do? Isaiah 66, 2 says this, For all those things my hand have made, and all those things exist, says the Lord. But one, one, on this one will I look, on him who is poor and of contrite spirit, and who trembles at my word. Psalms 51, 17, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, these, O oh God, you never despise. Isaiah 57, 15 says, For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him. I dwell with the high and holy place with him. Who has a contrite and humble heart. Means he's, I dwell in his home. The one who has a humble and contrite heart, who dwells in his home. To revive the spirit of the humble and revive the heart of the contrite one. When you come humbly, you are lifted up, is what he's saying. You are revived. Your heart's revived. Your spirit, your countenance. It's not just, hey, wake up. You're revived. Joseph's brothers, before they knew and received their full restorations, were on their feet, I mean on their knees, facing the ground. And tradition says you really don't look at a king or a higher official to that degree, unless, and you generally don't make eye contact with them. It's considered disrespectful. But when they did the one thing, he left his throne, his table, and took the bread of life, took bread from his table to where they were and met them where they were and fed them from his table. Not the table the servants set for them, his table. Because they did the one thing and they were lowly and contrite in those moments. He restored them. So this morning, and I'm closing with this, what is the one thing God is asking us to do to today to do? And I'm going to be flat out honest with you. It may be one of the hardest things you may ever have to do. Because everything in your mind, in the natural and in your flesh, may come against it. Maybe you've spoken words that came into agreement with I can't, I will never, I won't, I refuse to. Maybe you've had the thoughts, God doesn't want me to, but if it's of God, he's going to bring it up. 
and stir it in your heart. It will be a sacrifice. And it's not the kind of sacrifice that we think about. Sometimes the proliferate, I'm butchering that word, but uh, <laughs> sacrifices we think are is what God's asking. No. God isn't. The scriptures I just read, God isn't asking for a lot of things. He's asking for one thing, a humble heart and a contrite spirit. Because a humble heart and a contrite spirit is something he can work with. Because he cares about your heart, not about those other things. Those other things will have new meaning when he has your heart. When he has money. They'll take on a new meaning and they'll have more value when he has my heart. So it's hard to say, Lord, I'm giving this to you. I've been holding on to this for too long. I'm struggling with this. I've made inner vows to you to myself, I come into agreement with a lie from the enemy about this. I've been living kind of out of sync with you in this. Because imagine living with seven, at least 17, 16, 17 years of guilt and shame over what happened to Joseph. And now their fear went to a whole new level with losing it possibly a third level and the most valuable thing to their father. Would you stand with me right now? And this, and this is our time right now. And just, I want you to just position yourself to hear and receive. Open up your heart, open up your thoughts, open up your mind. And just listen to the Holy Spirit. Lord, what is this one thing you're asking of me? This one thing that would really release not just blessing in my life, but bring healing to my life and release prophetic destinies. It's singing out with life. I'm just repeating these words of the song we sang earlier. Just meditate on them right now. Listen to God. It's singing out with life. It's shouting down the lies. It echoes through the darkness of my night. Speaks a better word. It's calling out my name. And breaking the yoke of shame, fear, guilt, everything and everything. And it's making everything right. This word spoken over me. So Lord, come right now and with every person here. Would you speak to our hearts? Just speak to our hearts, Father. Holy Spirit, bring to memory things we're struggling with. The, the one thing. Bring it to life right now. Right now. And as he's bringing it to life, if you are ready, you may not be ready. Because things will dramatically change if you really are ready. And you've got to be willing to flow through the change. Joseph and his brothers received the I mean the brothers received the blessing, but it required them to flow with that blessing. That means they moved from where they were to each other and set up new residence requires action. Their whole, the history of their family was released into a new prophetic trajectory of destiny. As we come into agreement with what God is asking us to do, we have to physically do something, commit to things, and flow with what he's doing. So, Holy Spirit, speak to us right now. 
This is very much a private time. What are you willing to commit to God if you are ready to give him this one thing? This one thing. This one thing. Thank you, Jesus. If you're ready, just simply say, Jesus, I'm giving you this thing. Here it is. And however we do what you need to do is give it to him. Do it. And see. And then ask the Lord, what will the exchange be? What is the exchange? Abraham got descendants beyond the stars. Joseph's family. was healed as a family and restored and blessed, upgraded. I really believe God wants to do the same to us. And it doesn't necessarily mean financial or material upgrades, but that can happen as well. But it's an upgrade of our relationship and our heart. It's a healing of those wounds. What do we need to do? Thank you, Lord. I don't know if Luke or Amanda could come and just play something on the computer. Okay. Thank you, Lord. Let me just go right now. Thank you, Jesus. Just listening to Holy Spirit right now, and what I'm, I really feel like a, a spirit of freedom is inhabiting this place right now. Even you guys at home that are listening now, or at a later time. I feel like the spirit of freedom is being released. But there's, you know, as each one of us is committing, there's layers of freedom coming off and coming on to us, and burdens are being released. I'm going to close this in a minute and just want us to just sit with Jesus. And you can, when you're done with him, you're free to go. But don't stop the work. And don't go until the Holy Spirit starts with you. Let him minister to you. We all need healing, we all need restoration in one area or another. Speak for myself as well. So when we have these intimate times with the Lord, um, download information into your soul and your spirit and most of the time it's so private but I feel like I was just given a word for the body and the word came to me because I couldn't stop yawning but I'm not necessarily tired I'm rested I can't stop yawning and I was like why why am I reacting this way why am I yawning so much well, when we yawn, you're forcing a little bit of extra oxygen into your body. And you kind of it kind of forces you to just stop for a minute and take a breath. And sometimes we don't ever feel like we caught our breath. But when we yawn, we feel like we catch our breath. So I feel like what the Lord is saying is to inhale. <laughs> Inhale him a 
little bit deeper. That presence. Just inhale him a little bit deeper. <laughs> Rest. <laughs> and rest and <laughs> yeah so <laughs> well right now it's okay to rest in his presence just rest in his presence so I'm going to just officially dismiss us but stay with the Lord till he releases you and receive his goodness receive it in Jesus we just thank you for this morning Thank you for everything you've done and doing. And if, if for some reason you weren't ready to do this one thing yet, that's okay. Don't let the enemy play games with your heart and mind and tell you you're bad for not giving it to him right now. You're doing it right now. This is between you and the Lord. You don't need a formal service to go, get before Jesus and say, Jesus, here you go. When, when you're ready, as you commune and have intimate time with him, do it. Don't let guilt and shame, don't let the enemy have his way. Do it. That's not what this is about. And Jesus is not about that. So, Father, I thank you. My Father, I thank you so much for every heart that's here this morning. Just bless them and let you in their lives. Amen.